Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, a warm welcome to you all to the Green and Liberal Think Tank for us and uh, for today's event. Uh, we have some very special guests, but uh, before we introduce everyone, I would like to uh, present uh, the moderator for today, which is uh, Kerstin Lundgren. Please, welcome. Well, uh, who am I? Uh, actually, I'm um, going to, to lead this uh, or moderate this seminar, and I'm um, representing the Centre Party in the Parliament. Uh, Centre Party is a Green Liberal uh, thing uh, and a Green Liberal Party, and um, I'm also in the Foreign Affairs Committee, spokesperson for my party, but also third deputy speaker. Uh, so that is shortly who I am. And um, I've been to South Korea, also put a foot into North Korea, but not more than that. Um, and uh, I'm really looking forward. I can tell you all that we yesterday had an event in the Riksdag uh, for uh, presenting to the parliamentarians. Uh, we uh, Sadly, we had the seminar at the same time as the question time for the monthly question time for for the uh, prime minister and you know that uh, is really hard to challenge but uh, this uh, seminar will end uh, around 4:30 uh, and i hope we will have time for at least a few questions uh, from the audience before then and i will make sure that this is possible and uh, if there will be too much comments from the, uh, from the participants, I think you will have time for mingle afterwards so you can exchange views and raise questions you haven't been able to do during this seminar. But now I'm very pleased uh, to welcome up the uh, South Korean NGO, the Transitional Justice Working Group uh, to Stockholm. And uh, even if I know you have been here before uh, some days, so welcome to Forest. <laughs> and uh, I would like to begin uh, this seminar by welcoming them to introduce uh, the findings of their report. And I see you have all uh, found the report. So a big applause and welcome. Together? Yeah. Uh, okay, let's go together. Yes. I will perhaps take a s seat while you are presenting. Oh. Tall chair. And oh, I think it's better. I chair. guess you yeah, all nice wonder time. why huh? on earth didn't I present them? Hmm? But wonder. we have yeah. agreed that they are the best to present themselves. <laughs> so <laughs> feel free to yeah. present yourself. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, my name is Hubert Lee uh, from South Korea. Uh, it is a uh, great privilege yeah, to meet you, all the industry people and the concerned about human rights and democracy and then in Sweden and also the, the caring for the people in Ukraine as well and also the stretching out to the North Korean people as well. Yeah, really, really thank you so much. So the today, the, uh, yeah, the I'd like, you know, the on behalf of our team, TWG, yeah, first to express our gratitude first and then to give my, you know, uh, presentations to the, my co two colleagues, yeah, to be time-wise. Next year. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hi, I'm April Park, and I'm a researcher at TJWG. Ethan, do you want to introduce yourself? Oh, uh, yeah, just I'm a little. <laughs> Hi, I'm Ethan Hisokshin, also with the TJWG as a legal analyst. All right. Let's get into it. You want to give cool. a little? Cool. Okay. Bye. All right, so why are we here? Um, <laughs> we are here to present our new report um, that's been released a couple days ago. As you may all be aware, North Korea has conducted six nuclear tests so far, with the first one in 2006. And these have been conducted at the Punggyeri nuclear test site, which is located in the northeastern part of North Korea, near Mount Mantap. And just to give you a diagram of how, how the water circulates, um, water constantly flows within uh, the system in a form of both surface water and groundwater. And we believe that this is a primary medium of radiation leakage um, at the Punggyeri test site. 
So this is the map of the water streams in Pungeri um, region. And you can see that the streams um, trickle from the north to the southeast, um, eventually flowing into the East Sea. This is a different map of the streams. And you can see the streams flow through major cities like Kilchu or Kimchek City before flowing into the East Sea, the bottom. So it's important to understand that Pungeri is one of um, the regions with very high average precipitation in North Korea. And as you can see on this map, um, Pungeri has a lot of groundwater resources, um, which increases the likelihood of radiation leakage through water. And it's also concerning for us that um, groundwater is an important source of drinking water um, in this region. As you can see that the percentage of um, groundwater consumption in North Hamgyong is higher than that of other regions. And we believe that this uh, percentage to be higher because electricity shortage is very common in North Korea and um, piped water is not as reliable. So more people tend to rely on groundwater as their drinking water. So we have mapped the population living in the eight cities and counties within the 40 kilometer radius of the Pungeri test site, and also the population um, living near the water flowing downstream. So according to the 2008 census, which is unfortunately the, the most recent sense, um, data we can have our hands on, uh, about 1.08 million people um, are residing in this region. And if we estimate 50 or 25% of this population to be exposed to radiation, that's still, that number still amounts to hundreds and thousands of people. Another concern of ours is consumption of pine mushrooms um, produced from this region. So Pungeri is known for their pine mushrooms, which are delicacies in East Asian countries such as South Korea, China, and Japan. And even though South Korea and Japan have banned agricultural imports um, from North Korea since, I'll just speak louder, since the mid 2000s, um, it, the pine mushrooms are still being circulated to these countries through illegal smuggling. And we've, so it is possible that the radiation leakage affects not only the North Koreans um, residing in this region, but also South Koreans and Japanese um, citizens who are consuming these pine mushrooms. And I will ha hand over the floor to Ethan. Thank you, April. Mm -hmm. Let's tilt it a little. Yeah. Oops. Okay. Did I? Oh, no. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, uh, sorry about the technical <laughs> difficulties <laughs> I <laughs> just caused. Okay. Okay, yeah. right back on. Uh, my apologies for that. <laughs> uh, yes, yeah, so as we were discussing, uh, so in fact, in 2017 and 2018, uh, the South Korean government did conduct uh, radiation exposure tests on the North Korean SKPs from this particular region. And in the 2017 test results, of the 30 people tested, 10 people showed abnormalities uh, in radiation dosages. And in the following year, in 2018, uh, 5 out of 10 people tested uh, showed abnormalities. Now, you would think that given these worrying uh, results that the South Korean government uh, would have uh, continued or even expanded the, the number of tests, but the opposite, in fact, happened. Uh, so in 2017, uh, the government actually had an um, informal briefing for South Korean uh, reporters only. Uh, but in the case of the 2018 results, which actually had a higher rate of uh, abnormalities, uh, they didn't even actually announce the results uh, until nine months after, uh, until when the uh, mem certain members of the National Assembly uh, specifically raised this issue uh, with our Ministry of uh, Unification, actually at the, our prodding. Um, so at, at the during the National Assembly session in 2019, uh, the Minister of Unification at the time actually stated that he would continue to conduct these tests to uh, detect abnormalities. But as I've explained, uh, that did not happen, and uh, it has not happened uh, until now, uh, February of uh, 2023. And the test results, as I explained, are quite uh, concerning. Uh, the test result from 2017 uh, were the, the people who showed these abnormalities had lived in the area after the first and second nuclear tests, 
whereas the people who showed abnormalities in the 2018 tests had lived there uh, in first, second, and also other uh, subsequent tests in uh, North Korea. And uh, perhaps as a result of that, the second batch of people showed higher uh, doses, uh, doses of uh, radiation exposure. And when I say high, uh, the 350 uh, millisievert uh, was the, the, uh, the dosages from uh, Chernobyl, and 400 uh, was the number from uh, Chernob uh, the Fukushima uh, nuclear disaster in Japan. Uh, so we thought th these were very serious uh, uh, figures. But the South Korean government at the time explained that these uh, abnormalities could have been the results of uh, smoking history. Uh, which actually Hubert is also a smoker. Chain smoker. Uh, or uh, a result of medical tests because uh, and uh, of the, the x-rays and uh, CT scans that they've had. So naturally we found the, these explanations very unconvincing. And uh, we, while doing this, re re this uh, research, we obtained these numbers from the, no uh, the South Korean government uh, sources that uh, there are 881 uh, SKPs uh, from the uh, localities near the test site uh, uh, had, who had uh, escaped since escaped to uh, South Korea. And we know the unit price for cost of uh, conducting these tests. And uh, by multiplying the cost, we, uh, we know that the budget would require 1.2 US uh, 1.2 million US dollars, basically. So again, to highlight the fact that this is a question of uh, political will or the absence of it, not like the financial resources uh, that uh, are available. Uh, so going forward, what can be done? And uh, one of the reasons that uh, we uh, published these reports was to actually raise awareness about these issues. And since Sweden has uh, bilateral diplomatic ties with North Korea, uh, these issues can be raised uh, with the, the Pyongyang gov government in Pyongyang. And also at the UN level, obviously there are different uh, forums where these issues can be raised. And also in the Riksdag or the legislature, these issues can, uh, can be raised. Uh, similar to, uh, also by CSO and also by the media too. And also since uh, Sweden is a member of the EU, which also has a Magnitsky style uh, targeted sanctions, again, that's the uh, one way that uh, the, uh, those responsible can be held um, uh, to account. More specifically to the uh, the Pungeri issue uh, with respect to the South Korean government, it's encouraging uh, that we heard this morning, just this morning, that the South Korean uh, Ministry of Unification announced that they would uh, actually conduct uh, tests on the 881 known North Korean SKPs uh, from the localities that I mentioned. Uh, this was reported in the BBC. Uh, so we want to make sure, though, that uh, this is act this actually they actually follow through on what they've said. Uh, by continuing to raise the issue uh, in the media and the, in other forums. With respect to North Korea, it's uh, probably more <coughs> trickier. Uh, but uh, again, we noticed from in our past interactions with North Korea that the North Korean government is very unlikely to admit to any crimes or wrongdoings happening uh, when within the country. But when these issues, are specific issues are raised, they do react uh, in one man manner or another. And uh, we're hoping that by raising these issues bilaterally or, or you know, uh, multilaterally, that, for example, the North Korean authorities will tell the people living there that try not to drink from the groundwater or try to find some alternative water sources. And also since Sweden, uh, the gov Swedish government, and also the NGOs uh, have been providing humanitarian assistance uh, to the North Korean people for many years, uh, it's possible for the Swedish side to perhaps offer this kind of uh, medical assistance or test with respect to radiation exposure uh, in a manner that doesn't really offend uh, the sensibilities of North Korean government, and it might actually get through. Uh, again, uh, we are looking. We have had one of the challenges when we were conducting these uh, uh, research in South Korea was that we couldn't find independent re researchers. Uh, so we are looking for any experts out there in Sweden and uh, other countries that could help us with this research. And again, uh, it's because North Korea has been conducting missile launches, and also it wouldn't be surprising if they resume the nuclear test. And uh, in these discussions or in these resolutions or statements that condemn the North Korean actions, uh, again, these re re issues or the languages uh, could be included in such statements uh, to raise profile. 
uh, yeah, and uh, last but not least, China is another country that's very sp central to this uh, debate. Uh, China is actually the country that's closest to the Punggye nuclear test site. So they actually have an uh, interest or a stake uh, in this debate. So we also want to engage them in the way that we have engaged China in other human rights issues as well. Okay, so that's uh, our present um, brief description of our uh, uh, report. Thank you. Please, yeah. stay. Stay, okay. <laughs> okay. Well, thank you so much for, for a thought-provoking introduction. And um, before we let our expert panel uh, to the stage, uh, please allow me just some questions. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, First of all, um, when listening to your presentation, um, I mean you are you are dealing with what you can see in South Korea. Um, it's not so easy to get knowledge from mm. inside. Right. Uh, but what is the most disturbing result, as you see it, in your from your report? Um, any comments on on that? <laughs> oh, should he you yield the mic? Yeah. Or yeah, right. Oh, okay. Okay. Let me Do first start comment? off yeah. uh, the the information collection process. Yeah, it was really hard to obtain the detailed figures and the how many escapees actually the from that area. Yeah, settled down in Korea. So that's the simple number. Is already the governments have been aware of that already counted, and then the accessing that number really took year and year. <laughs> And so we engage as many of the lawmakers and the assistants to the lawmakers also demanded the just number. <laughs> and then but we couldn't like, you know, to get that. It was actually the last minute before we published the report, obtain that number. And then we can calculate and the budget it and then propose the government. Now yeah, the government is yeah, change their mind too, because all the revelations of this uncomfortable truth. And then government changes attitudes now. So we will yeah explain the further detail what the impact was. The other side was that information collections, uh, this particular beam and I conducted with the interview, met North Korean escapees into our office and asked just a simple question. Yeah. And then like, you know, the outside of the questions about the water drinking issues and the other thing. Just say the simply did you aware of that, you know, were you aware of that, the risk of this? And then they said, Yeah, sadly, we never thought about this never heard of this when they were living in North Korea. And just uh, what they believe or the, what they thought yeah, while they were living in North Korea, and that they became proud of that. Their town yeah, contributed to the strengthening <laughs> of the national power. And they now became very upset. And But what they actually being very sad is that the people still living there are fully aware of, unaware of this. That was the most disturbing thing. Mm. Well, I, I'm a little bit curious, although, because mm. uh, when, when people are uh, coming and uh, learning mm. about this, uh, this, well, these risks. Mm. I guess there are always uh, possibilities for people, even in the closed society, to r in some way reach out and letting mm. the word spread. Mm. Uh, and if they know people, relatives, whatever, in the area, have you any uh, idea mm. whether they are trying to reach out by some kind of well, smoke signals or whatever <laughs> uh, to, to uh, let the word spread. So we know for a fact that uh, there, there actually have been past news reports uh, in domestic and international news outlets of these mysterious uh, illnesses that have been afflicting the people living in the area, uh, stillborn babies and uh, other uh, unexplained Ill uh, sickness, uh, and also for from the South Korean escapees as well. But uh, the, unfortunately, as uh, Hubert just explained, uh, the North Korean authorities have not been explain, explaining this kind of risk to the people living there. And uh, it's, uh, it's also disturbing that even our own South Korean government has, uh, for various political reasons, uh, not, not really informed the public about these health risks. And I think uh, that, that is actually why we think it's very important uh, to... Uh, raise this issue by uh, publishing this report uh, to internationalize, publicize this issue uh, so that not only the South Korean government but also the more importantly part of the North Korean authorities will also uh, react by actually disseminating this kind of information or providing this kind of explanation of the various um, uh, diseases or illnesses that, illnesses that uh, 
people living in this area are suffering from? Well, spreading of the word and mm. spreading the mm. information. You have been doing that while here in Sweden. So mm. any uh, comments on, on the reactions from uh, media or so on uh, on the report that uh, you presented? Yeah, so the last time and the day before yesterday as well, so every night I just had to check all the media <laughs> thread. So <laughs> it's time consuming, but it's worth to do. And so total number of media coverage produced generated from this report yeah, the, the after the Tuesday, the, during the three days, and then over 200 media mentions made globally over 20 languages. So the, in Europe, and then the, in India, and then Pakistan, so all, yeah, the media just yeah, reported this. And then the commonalities of the, all the media coverage was that just, you know, the accepted our arguments and our findings yeah, in a very just organized manner. And then some of the interesting media coverage paid attention to that. Uh, there has been a curiosity why North Korea the stopped yeah, the seventh yeah, nuclear test. And then it was the unexplainable so far. And there was kind of the different yeah, conflicting argument or the, you know, hypothesis. But the some, yeah, the, the journalists have paid attention to that. This might be related to, and probably there is a possibility that North Korea and the Zoro team probably might also be concerned of, yeah, the disaster, irreversible, yeah, disaster may happen. So the many, this, uh, the report, uh, what, what we are happy is that not only this issue, but also to engage the other, the North Korea watcher and then the scholars, the professional, look into this matter. Yeah, those who can the study look into that with the, the medical, you know, professional, and then the nuclear exp yeah, expert, and also policy makers as well. So this uh, report itself has that the security component, human rights component, democracy component, information freedom component, and the medical component, so the variety of things. This is, uh, we believe, that engaging all the PP, yeah, the uh, all the concerned people, yeah, to collaborate to make a difference. Mm. Well, mm. I guess it's also an issue for South Korea after examining these 881 mm -hmm. personalities. Mm -hmm. uh, they need to have some kind of Disclosure. response and yeah. some mm -hmm. kind of help yeah. for, mm -hmm. for update. treatment. Please update uh, that. So is that something that you are bringing forward? Oh, absolutely. Uh, yeah. So as uh, we, as we that that w that was something that the next step that we were envisioning after the uh, the initial test the uh, extension of tests that the South Korean government conducts on the SKPs, and uh, I think it's important because uh, basically the people, as we discussed earlier, the people within North Korea cannot have do not have access to this information and do not have the freedom of uh, uh, expression or information to discuss these matters so i think it is important for uh not only the south koreans but we as a whole uh have a responsibility to speak for the people who cannot speak for themselves the namely the north korean people and uh, i think it's a great uh, uh, uh i guess the privilege of living in, in democracies like uh, uh, like also like in uh, Sweden, that we can raise these issues and the uh, media, the press can report on these issues. Politicians, CSOs, and other average citizens can take interest on these issues. Uh, so again, that's uh, something that we want to continue to do and uh, also encourage our South Korean government to take a more active stance uh, on this issue as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess it's not only uh, North Korea mm -hmm. who, uh, that has been uh, testing. There are other experiences as well. So I, um, I guess you are connecting dots in mm -hmm. North Korea, as I noted, on uh, abductions and so on. Mm -hmm. But, but uh, it's also a question of connecting dots on, on uh, experience from uh, testing nukes. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, what m uh, you mentioned a little bit about uh, the future, but uh, when you are going forward, what are the most crucial uh, issue, um, short term and long term, as you see it? So yeah, actually th we had uh, have had in mind that what's our next steps after the list report, and so the first uh, raising you know the awareness of the, the stakeholders, uh, the media, the the, the the various field of you know the expertise as well, but there's more there's concrete measures that to first pressuring or you know the persuading the South Korean government first to resume the testing, and then the Libya the test result not in a way that they covered up in the past, more the transparent way to the international community. 
Not to say it doesn't have to be like the attacking or the criticizing of Korea. Just that it's open for the engaging more the people willing to look into and then analyze it together. So that's how the so, you know the people can collaborate together. And the second step is to the uh, the sharing the information and then more the you know, make this uh, the, the coming yeah you know, jurors to put them to, in the scientific area. And then to avoid the political arguments that doesn't necessarily to be here, this is kind of scientific area. And also the uh, trying to find the momentum, yeah, to have the, the people outside North Korea can have to, on the on-site, you know, the measures or the, the assistance or the technical support and the provisions of the tools and then, yeah, to understand and then to find the measure. So that's a long-term thing. Um, but the, the happy news, yeah, we wanted to share what happened last night is actually the first short-term goal was accomplished. So the South Korean government announced, yeah, the six or the eight hours ago, yeah, to the press and then the South Korean government's Minister of Indications yeah, would conduct the full scale yeah, testing. So the, our first goal accomplished already. And the second mm -hmm. goal was the series of media. Media also very supportive. And also we really appreciate that all the international media, domestic media, and the media here, yeah, as well also support it. So we very appreciate that. So the long-term goal is to, yeah, how to solve this problem, yeah, is our, the final duties. Yeah, any uh, other comments on this? Uh, yeah, so actually, uh, obviously, uh, in the long term, uh, the ideal solution would be to actually have uh, uh, this kind of investigation on site uh, in North Korea. But we uh, understand that we were difficult um, without North Korean government's uh, uh, consent. And uh, since that's going to be a farther uh, out in the future, we do want to raise this issue uh, at the UN uh, based on the scientific findings uh, from the subsequent test uh, so that, uh, again, uh, make sure that this issue is not forgotten uh, in the international stage. And, uh, yeah, we've been, uh, as uh, Hubert mentioned, we've been uh, somewhat has seen some early success, but uh, we want to continue to build upon it. Well, there are uh, perspectives for the future as well, and of course, mm -hmm. uh, hopefully also for, for uh, the North Korean people concerned, uh, mm -hmm. hit by, by these tests. Right. Uh, and uh, I guess we are all congratulating you for the Thank first you success. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Thank you very much. And also for uh, mm. your published report, and uh, many thanks for your hard uh, and important work mm -hmm. uh, for bringing this forward mm. to the public. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank Once you. Again, thank you so hand. much. And uh, now it's time for the second panel. So thank you. Thank you, you may be <coughs> released <coughs> for the moment. <laughs> Here I have uh, the honor to present Benjamin Kelt. Katzef Silberstein, Associate Research Fellow at the Asia Program at the Swedish Institute of International Affairs and specializing on North Korea. And uh, Christina Sanklev, China expert and CEO at Sanklev Insights. Also happy to see, uh, glad to see you here in the panel. And then we have uh, Gabriel Jonsson, Associate Professor in Korean Studies at Stockholm University. And a work Warm welcome to all of you. I would like to start off with a question to all of you. Did the report findings come as a surprise for you or not? Should I? Uh, yes. Sir. Yes. So um, the, the findings did not come, come as a su surprise to me. Um, but I think it's it's extremely important that this sort of research has been done in order to substantiate um, substantiate what, what has been happening. People have suspected for a long time. I mean, it makes sense if you test massive loads of uh, nuclear weapons in a mountain. Of course, that that's going to do damage to the environment and to the people living in the area. So that's something that people have speculated on for, for uh, about for a long time. But bringing this to light in such a substantiated and thorough way. Um, is uh, it's 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 an incredible feat, and um, I'm um, I want to congratulate you on 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 the, the report itself, but also on your very concrete uh, um, impact on reality. So um, yeah, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm not surprised either. Uh, I think it was a very good report. I hope that you will also look into the prison camp that is located next to it. And but I, I know it's very hard, but it's uh, very interesting. And I agree <laughs> with what you said. Mm. So. Um. Uh, I didn't know about um, th this issue in, in North Korea, but could expect uh, that I it has become a, a problem because uh, nuclear tests conducted um, elsewhere, as, as in the Pacific, has had uh, uh, disastrous effects on local population's health. Uh, so so um, it is uh, important to ma make it known for um, b both uh, uh, the populations in the two Koreas and the outside world that, that this has happened. And uh, uh, I uh, find it very important that this work is um, uh, followed up by concrete measures. Uh, so that is very encouraging to hear uh, first uh, uh, that uh, the, the South Korean government has announced measures to uh, continue investigations and, and also that you plan to make the issue more uh, known worldwide because that's also I important to do to um, resolve the issue in, in some way. Uh, the final comment I have to do is we always must know that it's difficult to north about, uh, know about North Korea and considering that the number of es known escapees from the area is so low uh, we we'd hardly know anything about the overall content, uh, so, so um, it would be uh, desirable to f find uh, far more concrete data. Mm. Well, thank you mm. for for this, but uh, Benjamin, mm? let's start with you because I know you have to run. I do within <laughs> twenty minutes or I something do. like that. So mm. at first glance, mm. um, North Korea's warmongering uh, behavior might be interpreted as irrational, since it forces South Korea and others, uh, United States specifically, to respond by flexing its muscles. Do you find North Korea's uh, nuclear tests irrational? And do you expect another, or, or do you expect more tests to come? Uh, more tests will definitely come. I'm almost uh, fully confident on that. Um, when it comes to, to the rationality of this program, I actually want to bring, bring us back to something that uh, the, the past panel said about escapees from this area um, having a sense of uh, their region contributing to national pride and to national defense uh, because of the nuclear tests. It's important to understand just how strict and strong of a dictatorship North Korea is. Um, even though the the um, the government can't fund basic uh, welfare services, uh, there's virtually no no um, um, n no aid or assistance from the government f to the general population. Um, and a part of the reason for that is it's not because money is completely absent in North Korea, but um, it, it's about priorities, essentially the priorities of the government. And the nuclear weapons are a very rational priority, I think. Um, this is one reason. The fact that it actually works as a unifying measure for people within the country, even though you might think that given the, the uh, oppressive nature and incompetent nature of the North Korean state, that ordinary people would be against this. Um, and I don't think that that's necessarily always the case. And a big, big part of the reason for that is, of course, propaganda that starts from the moment that a person is born in North Korea and continues uh, for, for life. Um, so so it's, it's rational as a, a domestic symbol of unity. Uh, it creates a uh, very important feeling of uh, being um, all alone in the world um, against everyone else. Um, and it's a very important source of legitimacy for the regime. I would even say national identity at this point. Um, the alternative to nuclear weapons would be, I think what we all sort of imagine when we, when we talk about North Korea choosing a different path is that they would give up nuclear weapons, join the WTO or something, open up their borders to, to foreign trade and investment and things like that. Uh, the problem is um, that 
why, if, if, you, if the North Korean regime were to do that, there's many problems with them, but I want to hone in on legitimacy specifically. South Korea, right next door, is already an incredibly successful, wealthy democracy. What sort of legitimacy would the North Korean regime have if they tried to turn, turn the country into a new South Korea, so to speak? Um, and that's leaving out all the strategic aspects of the nuclear weapons, wh which, uh, wh where there's also a strong rationali rationality for the regime. Um, to to uh, to acquire the strongest possible uh, weapon kn known to man, um, to to uh, to defend ultimately defend uh, the regime and make sure that it stays in power. So I do believe it's rational. If I were Kim Jong Un's advisor, I would mm -hmm. plead with him to 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 um, obviously liberalize the country and allow for free elections and abolish the nukes. Uh, <laughs> but if I were looking out for his best interests, I would tell him to keep doing just what he's doing when it comes to nu nuclear weapons. Mm. Well. Sounds. Uh, Sorry to be a downer, but yeah, uh, yeah. <laughs> it's. Uh, well, uh, mm. looking into another, uh, I mean, we talked about media and and uh, the impact of the report so far. I know that Reuters have been uh, trying to get in touch with North Korea and UN representatives regarding this report. Um, do you find it likely that we will see any response from Pyongyang? I I found it I find it unlikely. I don't I don't think it's entirely impossible, but um it would be surprising. North Korea doesn't typically they they do respond sometimes to questions and criticisms on human rights or or um or, or these kinds of issues, but it's always with very short statements saying that it's all it's all lies and made up and our nuclear program is perfectly safe and uh, so on and so forth. Um, and I mean, we, we have to acknowledge also that even if, let's say, an individual bureaucrat at the North Korean uh, delegation in Geneva, that they would want to speak up, speak up about this or, or give some sort of statement, it's an e extremely rigid system where nobody does anything without clearance from, from, up, um, from um, up the line of command. Uh, so no, I very much doubt that we'll hear from them, but uh, they have an embassy here in Stockholm and uh, they have a Nolotta number uh, yeah, that yeah. you can call. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, so they are around. <laughs> they are yeah. around, but yeah. uh, let's see. Well, uh, I, I w myself was thinking also about the New START uh, discussion that has been coming up when Mr. President Putin was s telling that, well, perhaps we are, I we will be testing again. Mm. Um, yeah. And um, I mean, that could also have perhaps an impact on, on North Korea. On the other hand, China has been trying to uh, stress the fact don't use nukes. Uh, so, uh, w any comments on this uh, uh, bil or bilateral re connections? Sort of in, in the, the, the North Korean nuclear program in the context of uh, uh, Russia and yeah. China. I mean, the nuclear taboo is becoming less and less relevant, uh, I think, or not less, re less relevant, but less and less secure, um, which is a, 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 a big problem. But for North Korea, it's um, the fact that. I guess the fact that n that nuclear weapons are, um, let me rephrase that. Um, I think that um, um, because of the change, uh, because of the drastic changes in the global order, the the increased polarization between the China between, between China and the U.S., uh, North Korea is in a much more secure position today to 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 do conduct things like nu nuclear tests without really any significant consequences, uh, sanctions don't really matter unless you get China to implement them on North Korea and why would China do why would China do anything that the United States or the West wants today I really don't I, I think we're further away from that than we have been um, for a very long time if you look back at 2017 for example you know you China did implement some of the sanctions on North Korea quite forcefully but I, I think we we just live in such a different world today that those prospects are even even more distant mm. Well, we have been talking about Magnitsky sanctions. Uh, well, not easy to get a global uh, touch to that one, I guess. There's Thank a lot to do, though, actually. North Korea is not as sanctioned as people believe um, in a lot of ways. So there's a lot of banking uh, specific mm. things you can do on banking, uh, targeting Chinese banks that, uh, that house North Korean accounts and um, things like that. So there's actually a lot left to be done that isn't being done. Mm. Well, that's an interesting. We had the discussion yesterday beca uh, because China and perhaps moving money around, uh, you never know where they will uh, move. But, but uh, b mm, on the other hand, uh, finding uh, uh, people uh, who is uh, 
to blame or is responsible. Uh, accountability uh, should be, of course, uh, essential for that. And, and yeah. uh, we need names. Uh, and or companies or whatever. Yeah. I'm sure. I'm sure your our, our friends yeah. could provide. Yeah. yeah, we talked about that yesterday. <laughs> so thank you very much uh, you. Uh, for for your uh, uh, com comments on this report. And uh, I don't know if you have something more to tell. Say. Can I say what one last thing? Yeah. Just very very briefly. Yeah. Um, the the fact that uh, wh the region where these tests take place in North Korea is already one of the it's the most impoverished part of the country. It's the part where uh, the most vulnerable uh, part of the population already lives. So I just want to really drive home how important this is um, and, and how much human suffering uh, th that this contributes to an already very difficult situation for people in this northeastern region of North Korea, especially. Hmm. So, yeah. So thank you very much, Benjamin, uh, for for this. And I know that you you have to leave when you have to leave. Yeah. <laughs> I know the <laughs> idea behind that. <laughs> uh, so let's move to uh, you, Gabriel. Um, the report showcases a very modest response from the South Korean government up until yesterday evening. <laughs> then, uh, ta but taking health and uh, precautionary measures to radiate the uh, active uh, risk when it comes to North Korean trade goods, but mm. uh, to civilian defectors in particular. Mm. Why do you think that is so? Uh, do you think that this report puts more pressure? I mean, the first sign perhaps is there. Could there be more to come from the government in South Korea after uh, um, the door has been opened um, for, for uh, tackling also the trade of goods that was mentioned earlier? that is ongoing? Mm. Um, the first thing I have to say here is that, that it has happened many times in uh, inter-Korean relations that the two countries ha have uh, uh, agreed to do something but it has not been Im implemented uh, afterwards. In this case uh, the pressure comes from inside the South so that uh, may be a difference but uh, a major reason I, I would point like to point out that uh, the government had difficulties or, or, uh, to act or actually didn't do anything for, uh, for many years is that uh, often the South Korean government doesn't want to offend North Korea when it seeks to um, improve relations as was the case uh, during the previous Moon Jae-in government from 2017 to 2022. F for instance, the government uh, did not support uh, uh, the uh, UN General Assembly's human rights resolutions on North Korea, uh, which they did last year following the change of government. So, so that's always an, an issue in South Korea, whether how you should act in order not to uh, make uh, North Korea irritated. But now when we have another government, and uh, also it is an issue that I think uh, uh, we, uh, you should avoid making politics or something that is a health issue. Uh, what is a political or non-political issue is extremely difficult to determine in the case of inter-Korean relations because everything can be politics. But uh, in this case, if it's a question of, of saving lives in, in, in um, urgent situations, I think um, there is a good reason to to act a and um, uh, what isn't known in Sweden is that uh, there were some cases last year both during the new government and the Moon Jae-in government of uh, humanitarian aid given to North Korea which means that um, political considerations can sometimes be excluded from context so my, my, my hope is that uh, concrete measures will be taken to uh, first uh, uh, make investigations within South Korea of defectors to make the issue more known and then try to make the issue more known uh, also outside the country. And of course, since the UN is, is a, a central uh, organization for, for uh, uh, pursuing uh, issues globally, uh, the UN is also an important contact. Mm. 
Yeah, but on the other hand, you can say that uh, I mean the 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 trade seem to be going in in South East Asia area, mm. and and the collaboration between countries in the region could perhaps um, s clarify mm. the origin of mm. the mushrooms. Uh, so that could also be a question. Will that be a question raised as you see it? Thank you, Benjamin, once again. Oh, um, um, of course, uh, the more people, uh, the more countries that are involved in an issue, uh, uh, the more complicated it may become to resolve it, particularly if, if uh, parties involved have different interests to, to uh, preserve. But on the other hand, uh, the chances to, to get to know the actual extent of the issue should become better. A and uh, involving the UN is important because it, it's not a country. Mm. Well, <laughs> going to you, Christina, um, even though sanctions are active, extensive smuggling is taking place, as we were talking about. Um, in the North Korean Chinese border, mm. um, who is the interest, or wha what interest is behind that? Uh, is it China's interest, or is it uh, embarrassing uh, that it is happening right under their nose? Is it uh, some kind of? Um, well, when it comes to illegal smuggling, yeah. I think that is the gangsters that are doing that. And they don't really care, I think. Because if they can make money, then they can make money. And so they don't really care if these mushrooms are radioactive. And they maybe they would actually, if they knew that these, if it was common knowledge that these um, mushrooms were or food stuff were uh, dangerous, maybe they sh would probably buy uh, like Geiger meters to try to check. <laughs> because mm. I, but I think that they don't really care. But I think, and I think that the Chinese government, they don't really care either. I mean, they have similar problems in Xinjiang, for example, with Uyghurs who have been exposed to radiation after their nuclear tests in the 70s and so on. And uh, they don't really care about the Uyghurs. They care more about the PLA Han Chinese uh, military guys who have been affected. Those people they care. But I do think that if uh, it would become common knowledge in China, maybe uh, the local uh, party secretaries in the region, in Jilin province, for example, they would probably care. And I think that Xi Jinping would definitely care if he ended up with having these exclusive uh, pine mushrooms being served to him. I think he would he very, would for the he origin. would definitely would like to know where. So I think that there are definitely potential, but you need to basically spread the information in China as well. So you have to spread a Geiger meter. Uh, to to uh, the smugglers. The thing is that Chinese people are very into healthy mm. things. You know the ch traditional Chinese medicine. They everything. I mean, you get pimples if you eat chili, uh, spicy food. I don't know how many times I've been with Chinese friends and the girls go like, no, no, I can't eat this because I get pimples. And uh, they're very well aware of these things. And also because uh, the Chinese health care system does not really work very well. So people have a self-interest in not getting ill. So I do think that this is definitely something that would be interesting for the Chinese consumers at least. So there is definitely potential. But at the moment, as long as we don't talk about it, um, and I don't know if it's possible to reach out to uh, GCTN or whatever, uh, to see, uh, uh, see or, or whatever, like these, uh, see, what is it called? But these like Global Times and uh, CCTV and so on, and see if they would be, because I, but I do believe that they are probably interested in these things, at mm -hmm. least the normal people. And reaching out to the region uh, where the smugglers are moving around, selling the products perhaps also, uh, yeah. could also be, as you see it. Uh, but I think also you, you should also be aware of the fact that things are, the information is actually spreading from South Korea into North Korea, through, not least through the Yamangdang, these uh, markets that are all over the place. Uh, it says that, uh, I mean, uh, I heard, I read somewhere that uh, when Kim, Il, uh, Kim Jong-il died, 
uh, that's where people f knew about it long before it came out in media because it came out first in South Korean media and uh, like radio and so so on, radio free Asia and so on. So I think that's uh, also important that those kind of because these are things that people are probably worrying about. But then we have also to remember that it's not possible for North Koreans to move around legally. They are like under a Stal Stalinist uh, society where you have to have documents proving that you are allowed to leave mm. your county. Yeah. So it is p it's, uh, it's a complex situation, but yeah. Smugglers are obviously allowed. Um, well, smugglers are actually tolerated because they are doing good things. I mean, if there were no smugglers, people in uh, North Korea would probably have even less mm. to eat. Mm. So you smuggle uh, meth uh, or whatever, like drugs, out of North Korea and you buy toilet paper and uh, soap and food, s instant noodles and so on. And then that's how you are actually supporting yourself. Without free the free markets in North Korea, would there would have been much many more North Koreans starving to death. Mm. Well, free market. Sounds well, but uh, <laughs> I know it sounds weird, but you know, like these, uh, like yeah, you had yeah. in the at the end of the Soviet yeah. Union, where yeah, you yeah. have people selling their own stuff in them. Yeah, 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 so yeah. this is very, very important. People are always inventing, uh, yes, and make use of possibilities. And Definitely. on the other hand, it is on the uh, acceptance of the authorities in these kind of. They probably buy food there as well. Yeah, <laughs> cheaper. Well, uh, I promised that we should have uh, give the r time for, for uh, questions from the audience. So uh, please, also my North <laughs> o o o o questions on the North Korean report. So please, uh, uh, I would ask you also to stand in the panel, if so, for, for answering questions. And I know you ha we have uh, a mic. So feel free, questions. To any of the first or the second panel. Um, <coughs> yes. Hello. Yes, I, I'm Benita Funke from the Embassy of Switzerland. I have a perhaps technical question uh, regarding these tests. Um, the the size, the magnitude of the last one is much uh, bigger than the rest of them. Was is it's known now? that this was an another different type of uh, bomb uh, than the previous ones? Uh, it w if it was a hydrogen bomb or... Uh, because here it in, in this map, I just l looked at it briefly, it says about the, um, uh, the, the kilotons that are... But uh, how is it known about the radiation from that specific um, explosion? Mm. Anyone of you wants to answer? The mic, the mic, please. Scaled up. Yeah. Use so the mic. This what yeah. It's on. It's on. Yeah, what is anticipated for the... Yeah, uh, yeah. because it is we initially, like, the, the in our report, details, you know, the, the, the writing, and then it's actually this is distracting the readers to, yeah, the <laughs> lead the world of the scientist area. So that's why, but, yeah, the why it's uh, inflated or the magnitude increase is that North Korea first want to have the very... Uh, the power pool, yeah, the weapon force. And then the seventh uh, the nuclear test is the anticipated to be the size being smaller and then to be used for the strategy, yeah, the weapon. So, yeah, that's, we don't know. Yeah, what can be the next one? Well, any comments from you on, on that? No? Any other mm -hmm. questions? This is the time for you. Mm -hmm. Yes. Uh, thank you so much for a very interesting uh, debate here today. Uh, I have a question regarding what uh, Benjamin talked about, that the nukes were such a big part of the North Korean identity. Um, and then I also thought about that in the presentation that you guys had some examples for, for example, how Sweden could leverage in, in this matter. Uh, do you think that the West do have leverage to negotiate in this matter uh, to affect the outcome? Yes. Oh, yes. Thank you. Uh, excellent question. Thank you. So, yes, North Korea is not an easy uh, party to negotiate or uh, talk to, <laughs> obviously. 
Uh, but uh, we did notice uh, in these human rights dialogues or um, uh, issues raising that uh, they do uh, respond again, like you know, in this kind of very private, uh, behind-the-scenes manner, especially when these specific uh, questions or issues are raised. So uh, rather than asking these kind of general questions about, like, for example, uh, stop like uh, public executions, or it's more probably useful to say, uh, so there were public executions reported in like uh, certain cities, Kirchu or some other towns. Uh, what do you think about that? That kind of tends to get more of their attention. Uh, we've noticed also when the COI report from the United Nations came out ten, nine years ago, that uh, internally there have been uh, directives from Pyongyang to the local um, intelligence or police forces to kind of tone down on the, the brutal um, interrogation or torture, basically, that they're conducting. And uh, there reportedly have been cases of uh, individual officials being reprimanded for uh, excessive torture. Uh, so having this kind of international attention uh, especially with this kind of particular focus on um, details does tend to generate uh, some positive uh, changes, even if they don't, like, uh, never admit it publicly. And, uh, and the other example would be in the previous uh, Universal Periodic Review at the Human Rights Council, it's basically where every country gets te like um, their human rights recommendations from other member states. Uh, the Swedish government recommended to North Korea to actually publish uh, human rights treaties in the Kwangmyung uh, network, which is actually North Korea's nationwide intranet uh, network. And uh, so that was a pretty unique recommendation. And uh, uh, I think that having that kind of very uh, specific focused uh, questions uh, do tend to uh, generate changes on the ground, if, even if they don't necessarily uh, lead to better conversations with North Korean diplomats. Mm. Mm. Well, do we have time for a last question? I if so, uh, yeah, it is a very good time to uh, to hear your hard work. Yeah, so without any help from the officials, support from the Korean government. So yeah. anyway. So I'm wondering, so do you have any collaboration with other NGOs uh, working in North Korea? Uh, it's my first question. Uh, second question is with uh, the Ukraine war, the, the cooperation between Russia and North Korea getting stronger. Mm -hmm. So I think uh, North Korea is getting audacious. It's, uh, it's uh, authoritarian regime. So it is very difficult to solve this kind of uh, the ultra contamination issue could be resolved in the near future. So maybe yeah, very skeptical future I expect, but we have to do work uh, continuously. I think. Mm. Yeah. Last comment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> So Maybe you come over here. So come you over can yeah. Really? Because they're Please. recording ah, it. Ah, there. So we Please. can be all at this okay. stage yeah, <laughs> in the end now. Involved, Please. Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Please. Join me. Yeah, everybody I just knows that today is very uh, the, the important day, actually. The, the first the yeah, the full year of that, uh, Russia's invasion yeah, to Ukraine. And so we brought this time with those great issues. But back in Seoul, we also have, you know, the the mobilize the support yeah to our solidarity to ukraine people as well so the hosting the public hearing the seminar inside the national assembly as well and also the hosting the seminar and the inviting the ukraine you know activists to korea to speak up so that's why the the reason why there is a reason why because the the ukraine situations is we found the very similar as commonalities mm -hmm. yeah and the uh, intrinsic you know the fundamentally and then the, if uh, Russia wins, yeah. And then this actually emboldened North Korea. And then would not think of that giving up nuclear. And so that's why the victories of the Ukraine is also very important yeah, to solve the matter with North Korea as well. So that's why yeah, we are being connected. Uh, the second, yeah, the questions like the, how the, we work with other organizations, other NGOs. 
uh, the, we see that those who actually the outside of government side, the civil society, we call broadly, actually have assisted a lot, encouraging us and then providing connections and individual connections to those who have the very conscious people and then to support these projects. So the, not only in Korea, but also already we are greatly indebted yeah, to everyone here. <laughs> Yeah. So the while we are staying here, we met a lot of the different, you know, civil society and professional NGOs and the institution thing thing. We receive very, very, yeah, the humbly a lot of encouragement. So that's why uh, this we think that we can, yeah, keep this work going on. Absolutely, I second what uh, Younghan just said. Everything, and also want to add that uh, uh, again. Uh, in South Korea, obviously, there's uh, uh, much less, uh, I will say, I guess, a uh, interest on the North Ukraine war because of the distance, uh, and also uh, the yeah, because our, we are more focused on North Korean issues all the time. Mm -hmm. But I always tell my country fellow countrymen and women that uh, this war matters a lot, not only because it's a, a, a principle at issue about international law, human rights, and uh, uh, democracy, but also because uh, if uh, if Ukraine were to actually win this war, basically beat back the Russians, uh, that would send a message to North Korea, the North Korean government as well, uh, that uh, North Korea, and one of the reasons that they are so fixated on developing the nuclear weapons is to, uh, because of the security reason, but if you see Russia, a nuclear state, weapon state, unable to defeat or conquer uh, Ukraine, which is a non-nuclear uh, non uh, weapon state, that should uh, probably have, we, I'm pretty sure that would have some uh, result in some reconsideration on the North Korean side as well. So again, that's uh, something that we wanted to uh, emphasize with when we work with the Ukrainian NGOs. Uh, and uh, also lastly, uh, it's important to keep up this kind of international attention, public publicity on this issue, uh, and uh, to work together uh, with NGOs, the media, and uh, governments. Uh, and I also want to thank all of you uh, today for coming here and uh, showing your interest in this particular matter. Uh, I think we need this kind of uh, solidarity going forward uh, to uh, for greater uh, democracy and uh, freedom in uh, not only in uh, North Korea but in other uh, country situations as well. So thank you very much. Thank you. And um, I will also give a sh for a short, I know that we are dragging some of the mingled time. <laughs> Uh, but please, Gabriel, if you want to have a last comment on before we are closing the seminar. Um, uh, it has partly to do with what has been said, and that is uh, uh, we heard that the free markets was a, um, a channel to convey the message of um, the previous leader, Kim Jong-il's death. So in relation to that, I would like to point out one thing that we don't know about, but we could assume uh, is different from what, what we expect in terms of North Koreans actually knowing more about what is happening in the country mm -hmm. than we can expect. Because uh, however authoritarian a government is, it, it cannot control what every p person is doing. Uh, but uh, uh, an equally important question to ask is, what can they do wi wi with this knowledge? And uh, I believe they cannot do if, if, if uh, they are oppressed, but uh, it, it can create uh, a new situation in the long run if, if that uh, control cannot be maintained. Mm -hmm. Christina, I you agree. Do you I want to have the last <laughs> comment as well? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. No, but, no, but basically I think that uh, North Koreans, we have a, uh, I think the view in the West is that they are very brainwashed and they don't know anything about outside. But I, I, I don't really believe that I do believe that North Korea and especially the younger generation know much more about what is going on in South Korea. You have fashion and so on. Uh, I mean, they are super innovative. So, for example, one thing that young North Koreans like to do is watch South Korean movies. And you have wonderful movies in South Korea on TV series and so on. And a way to get to for the police to to bust these people is that they when they do raids into apartments you actually close uh, turn off the electricity first but so you have instead you have in, they have invented dvd players where you have the kim jong il movie 
in and you have a USB stick where you have <laughs> parasite or whatever you're watching. <laughs> And you can hide away the parasite. So if, if they would get busted, well, we're watching uh, these Kim Il Sung movies. So they are very. So we should we should be aware yeah. of this. People are always a hope, yes. and uh, <laughs> that is uh, the the inventive people and creative people is of course making change happen. Yeah. Has been throughout history, and uh, I hope that uh, you will feel as well, that you have been with your report, Making Change Happen. Mm. Uh, and uh, I would like to thank you for uh, coming here and for the taking part in the panel. And you, uh, both Christina and Gabriel, for being part of this last panel. And last but not least, all of you attending this seminar. And thank you to you all, and thank you to Forrest for hosting, uh, arranging this seminar. And a big applause. Thank <laughs> you.